say one. Hey, we're good. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Constitution Center. Wishing everyone a very happy Juneteenth. Uh, it has been a wonderful day filled with programs uh, celebrating Juneteenth. We've been learning a little bit about the history of the holiday, uh, our nation's second Independence Day, uh, and some of the key figures who made this day a reality. Um, but I'm really excited. Our final program of the day is going to be the Four Harriets of History, where we're going to learn a little bit about four women, all named Harriet, uh, who use Use their voices to fight for freedom and equality for all. Um, this is one of my favorite programs. I really hope you enjoy it. It's a wonderful opportunity to explore uh, some of those, those faces behind these big concepts of freedom and equality for all. So we've got about ooh, a couple minutes until go time. Two, two or so minutes, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, but do me a favor, if you don't mind, uh, feel free to pop in the chat uh, where you're tuning in from, who you are tuning in with. Uh, we love to see where everyone kind of comes from all over the country for these programs. So feel free to pop that in if you'd like to share, uh, and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Excited that you're all here today. Thank you for tuning in. I see we've got some friends from Massachusetts, very exciting, from New Jersey, wonderful, from Pennsylvania, from Philly, wonderful, wonderful. If you were at the NAT or if you were in uh, the Philadelphia area today, the National Constitution Center, we offered free admission courtesy of Citizens Bank. Thank you, citizens. Uh, free admission to the center in celebration of Juneteenth. Um, but don't worry, we have uh, a couple of other three actually big free admission days coming up if you're going to be in the Philadelphia area on June 28th on July 2nd and on July 4th. So if you're in the area or you wanna visit the area, uh, try and time your visit around one of those days so that you can check out all that the center has to offer. All right, we've got about one more minute until we get started uh, and then we are going to begin our Four Harriet show. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. This has been a wonderful day of learning. Uh, I've been tuning into all of the virtual programs that we've been offering, and it's been so much fun to, to learn more about Juneteenth, learn more about the holiday, the origins, the celebration, uh, how it ties to the Constitution, all of that good stuff. Um, it's been uh, a lot of fun. So I'm excited that you're all here today to celebrate this important day with all of us at the National Constitution Center. And I will tell you, this is one of my this is one of my uh, favorite programs that we do here, um, and it's it's a it's a good one. You're going to learn a little bit about these four women on the screen in front of me uh, and how they contributed to the movement to abolish slavery for all. Oh, very nice. We've got Virginia here. Awesome! Excited to have you. We've got Virginia, California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Yes. Looks like we have some Texas people as well. Wonderful. Well, it looks like it's about that time, so we might as well uh, go ahead and get started for our final Juneteenth program of the day. Uh, but once again, hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Constitution Center. My name is Madison, and I'm a member of the Center's education team, and I am delighted to be here with you today uh, celebrating Juneteenth. Um, we've had a number of very exciting programs happening today, uh, but this one, I will tell you, we all have our favorites at the Constitution Center, and this one is mine. Um, this this is the Four Harriets of History, where we are going to learn a little bit about um, four women, uh, all named Harriet, who used their voices uh, to fight for freedom and equality for all. 
So um, I am getting a couple comments in the chat. Can you just give me a yes or a thumbs up if my audio is working? Can everyone hear me okay? Um, Marley, if you're having some problems, I recommend maybe rejoining the webinar um, and that should be able to work. Awesome. It looks like my, my audio is coming through. Excellent. All right, everyone. So we're going to begin the four Harriets now. Uh, and where we like to begin things, and it makes sense, at the National Constitution Center is in the year 1787. That's where our story for today's purposes begins. Uh, in 1787, 55 delegates gathered in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. And from May until September of that year, uh, they worked to create our government. As we know today, they worked to create the Constitution. Uh, you know, for all of their successes, what did they do that summer? right? They created the legislative branch, the judiciary. Uh, they figured out how to elect the president, um, you know, for all of these, you know, successes or wins, if you will, in creating our constitutional structure, um, there is one major institution, one major issue that they're just not able to grapple with at the convention. And that, of course, is the institution of slavery. So I'm going to pull you in here to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we have this painting here that kind of gives you a nice oversight of, of who is attending this convention. Uh, we have all, well, we have 12 of the 13 original states represented. Rhode Island didn't send anybody to the convention. But just looking at this picture, I'm betting that you can tell uh, who is excluded um, from this from this constitutional convention. We see a whole lot of wigs in this picture, right? We see a whole lot of, of white hair, uh, white men, uh, middle-aged white men who are relatively wealthy, landowning men who have come to create this new government. Uh, one of the major issues that these men kind of disagree upon during the summer is, of course, over the institution of slavery. Over 20 of these guys are slaveholders themselves. Uh, and when it comes to the, the conversation of what should we do in regard to slavery when we're creating this new constitution is do we include it in the constitution? Do we not? Do we take it this opportunity to abolish slavery now? Uh, you know, there are a couple delegates, one that jumps out to us um, originally from New York, but made his, made his home in Pennsylvania as a delegate from Pennsylvania is Governor Morris, who says that we should use this as an opportunity to abolish slavery, let it be gone. You know, let's seize the opportunity and be done with it. Um, you know, but we do, of course, realize that at the end of the convention, that slavery is the one in, what is one of the big issues that they could just not agree on. So what they decide to do uh, with the new constitution is they have several nods to slavery, if you will. We don't specifically mention the word itself in the original constitution, but by way of the three-fifths clause that counts three-fifths uh, or that counts enslaved individuals as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of representation in Congress, that's one way that we see slavery very much acknowledged in the constitution. We also see that Congress is not to touch the slave trade for a number of years. So when we begin our new nation under we the people after the constitution is ratified a couple years later, slavery is very much part of our nation. It's embedded into our national fabric. Uh, a lot of people are very surprised to find many of our visitors or learners to discover that all 13 of the original states had slavery in some capacity. Um, and what we see as we make our way throughout the program today is that over the next several decades, slavery is going to become a big issue when we are expanding our country. You know, we've all heard that from sea to sign, from sea to shining sea. You know, adding new states, going beyond those thirteen, uh, is where we find our first Harriet, our first Harriet in this story here. So like I mentioned, as we're trying to expand our way west, north, west, south, all that good stuff, we're expanding the country. Uh, and every time we want to add a new state, a new flag, something that you think would be a cause for a national celebration, it further inflames this issue, this institution of slavery. Because the big question around admitting new states into the union is, is it going to be a slave state or is it going to be a free state? Well, in 1820, a senator from Kentucky named Henry Clay says, I have an idea. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a line. If you can kind of see it here, I've highlighted a little bit. There's a red line across the southern border of Missouri. We're going to draw that line all the way west. And the idea is, is that every new state, every state south of that line is open to slavery. Slavery is permitted within that territory, within that state. And everything north of that line, everything above that line is free territory. No slavery allowed. So enter our first Harriet, Harriet Robinson Scott. 
Now, Harriet Robinson is born around 1850. We don't know the exact date because the records of enslaved individuals were not kept uh, in, in such high quantity or with such diligence as, as non-enslaved people. Um, so Harriet Robinson is born in Virginia in around 1815. Uh, and when she's quite young, I think in her teenage years, um, she is taken by her enslaver, um, a gentleman who is in the uh he was a military officer um, in the um, he's a military officer and he's relocated to Fort Snelling, like present day Minnesota. And he takes Harriet with him uh, and she's working in present day Minnesota, which if we're looking at the map in front of us, that is above that Missouri compromise line of 1820. So she's working there enslaved. Uh, despite this this law that has been passed that says that slavery is not to exist above this above this line here. So she's working uh, as an enslaved person. Uh, and while she's there, uh, she will meet some of you may know her probably a little bit more famous husband dread. And Harriet and Dredd, the Scots, will marry with the permission of their enslavers. Now, some time goes by and they have two beautiful daughters, Eliza and Lizzie. And it's when Eliza and Lizzie begin to get a little bit older that Harriet is really this driving force who has this, who, who is understanding and realizes what the fate of her daughters could be. When they get a little bit older, they're probably going to be sold from her. They're going to be separated. The family unit will be broken up unbelievably common during this time period with families uh, of enslaved individuals. They would be sold, you know, just without, without any notice, just as, as punishment for, for a transgression that they've, they've, they've inflicted upon their, their enslavers. I mean, it happened frequently. And so she realizes this and, and wants to combat this slavery. She needs to break her family out of, out of slavery. And so what is she going to do? How is she going to fight this? Well, she is going to turn to the Constitution. Uh, she looks at that very first amendment, uh, the first amendment to the Constitution, uh, protecting some of our rights, um, some of our most cherished freedoms. And Dred and Harriet Scott are going to petition the courts for their freedom. Uh, they will file a freedom suit. In 1846, we have actually in the Constitution Center's exhibit in Philadelphia, we do have um, Dred and Harriet's petitions for freedoms. We rotate them, uh, but I put a little picture of it on here on the screen here on the right. Um, Harriet and Dred did not know how to read or write, so this was actually not written by them, but they did make their mark at the very bottom here. If you can kind of see the bottom right-hand corner, they made a little X to show that their mark on this petition. Uh, and this petition will be filed in 1846, but it's going to take about 11 years for a decision to be made. Uh, it makes its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, where in 1857, there's a couple of big questions before the court. And the first big one is, well, are African-Americans citizens? And then the second one is, do they have rights? And the court will decide in 1857, infamously, uh, that Dred and Harriet Scott had no rights, which, quote, the white man was bound to respect. And in the opinion of historians of the court, this is one of the worst decisions in the court's history, and it will further accelerate the nation toward war. So they will lose this suit. Uh, if any of you have ever been to St. Louis, um, I've included on the slide here, there's a beautiful statue of Dred and Harriet Scott um, that faces east. Uh, they're looking toward the arch and they're looking east, um, kind, of, kind of embracing each other. Uh, and you can learn a little bit more about you know, their time in St. Louis in these courts and, and these freedom suits and how they fought so hard to keep their family together. So while this was initially uh, um, considered a, a loss or, you know, uh, it's not exactly the outcome that we wanted in this decision, it has a very lasting impact in that this court case will further accelerate the nation toward war. People are mad now. The abolitionists are, are growing. Their clamor is growing. Uh, you know, it really begins to kind of stretch and pull the tensions of the nation uh, quite tight. Uh, which brings us now to our second of our four Harriets, probably the most recognizable. Um, you probably know her as the Moses of her people, the leader of the Underground Railroad, uh, one Miss Harriet Tubman. Now, just a couple years later, after Harriet Scott um, will file the petition in 1846, uh, Harriet Tubman um, is going to use her voice and her agency uh, to combat uh, slavery as well. Now, Harriet Tubman 
incredible woman, right? We, we know her, her incredible, uh, strength and her time, um, just as an incredible human growing up in slavery enslaved on the Eastern shore of Maryland. She was very defiant as a child. And she quickly realized that slavery was a terrible institution, a horrible institution. Uh, and she had acknowledged that she knew that she had a right to two things, liberty or death. And if she could not have one, she would have the other very kind of big spirit in the sense uh, that she knew that slavery was a moral, moral uh, tragedy, you know, an immoral tragedy, if you will. And she needed to do something to escape. Uh, notice where the arrow is on the screen, though. She's located on the eastern shore of Maryland, which did permit slavery. Um, and so she's not too far from some free states. So what is she going to do? How is she going to, uh, you know, escape to freedom? She's going to do just that. She's going to run away. She's going to use that system, uh, uh, return to use that system known as the Underground Railroad. Now, the Underground Railroad, we, we've all probably heard of it, right? But we actually don't know too much about the Underground Railroad. And we have to think about why that is. Uh, there are not a lot of records kept uh, for, for some obvious reasons, right? We don't want them falling into the wrong hands of someone, uh, you know, who would possibly want to do harm or return a freedom seeker back to enslavement. So there's not a ton of records about the Underground Railroad. However, there is a man named William Still, and he lives in Philadelphia, um, and he is uh, good friends with Harriet Tubman. They they do work together. Um, and William Still is nicknamed the father of the Underground Railroad because William Still keeps records, diligent records of freedom seekers, where they're fleeing to, where they're fleeing from, if they're taking a new name, what it's going to be, all for the purposes of reuniting families after the Civil War, because many are going to, many of these freedom seekers are, are leaving at great personal sacrifice. Not only are they going to have uh, rewards posted for their return, as you can see on the screen here, uh, they're going to face unimaginable, uh, you know, elements regarding, you know, weather uh, and, and, you know, finding new family, finding people to trust, finding ways to, you know, to find their freedom. So William still keeps these records and publishes them. Uh, and we at the National Constitution Center have a first edition of his book called The Underground Railroad uh, that you can see the next time you come and visit our exhibit. But back to Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, because once Harriet escapes to freedom, she could have stopped there. That was a miracle on its own, the fact that she was brave enough to leave and, and find freedom when she crosses over into this free territory. But that's not where Harriet Tubman stops. And we kind of know this story, right? Harriet Tubman is unbelievably brave. She returns to the South at least, we think, about 19 times, helping to free around 300 enslaved individuals on various trips, bringing them out of enslavement. Uh, we know that she likes to travel under the cover of night. Uh, she prefers traveling in the winter because of those longer hours of darkness. We know that she carries a gun with her uh, for protection. Uh, Harriet Tubman is, you know, she develops this reputation and she works with, um, with, with other leaders of the abolitionist movement. She's doing the work on the ground, but she will drop off, you know, these freedom seekers at at her friend's house. Um, uh, some of you may know Lucretia Mott, uh, a famous Quaker woman and abolitionist and suffragist from Philadelphia. Um, well, her sister, Martha Coffin Wright, tells Harriet Tubman, bring your freedom seekers to my house. You can keep them here and keep them safe, you know, while they're moving from station to station on the Underground Railroad. Um, so you see these, these brilliant kind of um, plans kind of coming out that Harriet Tubman is really kind of spearheading. She's she's making it happen on the ground. She's an incredible woman. Uh, and it's incredibly important that we acknowledge just how dangerous it was for her to bring these people with her. She risked great personal harm every single time that she returned to free, um, you know, to free uh, other enslaved individuals. And it's an amazing, amazing story. We're not done talking about her. We're going to talk about her in a little bit. Um, but we have to move on to our third Harriet. Now, important that uh, Harriet Robinson Scott and Harriet Tubman uh, obtain their freedom. It's also unbelievably important that people who might be relatively removed from slavery, um, depending on maybe geographically where they are or if they just don't know the atrocities of slavery, it's important for them to know what they're fighting against, what this abolition movement is all about. Uh, and that's where our third Harriet comes in, uh, one Harriet Beecher Stowe. 
Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe, different from our other Harriets in that she is white and she is born free, and she is also formally educated. Uh, she's from originally from Connecticut, as you can see in the top arrow on the screen there, pretty removed from, you know, this kind of concentrated portion of slavery uh, that, that it really finds itself um, in the southern states as we kind of make our way down our timeline here. But Harriet Beecher Stowe will travel to Ohio and kind of right on the border there that you see that second arrow on the left uh, and really becomes familiar with, um, you know, with firsthand accounts of uh, formerly enslaved people. She sees race riots. Um, she talks with, with mothers who have been separated from their children, who have been sold apart, separated, families shattered. Uh, and she's moved by these accounts. Um, she herself has lost her 18-month-old son, Samuel. So she finds a little bit of a connection, an empathetic connection there um, to, to this idea of being separated from your child. And she's heartbroken to hear these stories. Um, and and she's, you know, exposed to, to stories and to the humanity that she has never seen before. So what is she going to do? How is she going to fight in this cause to abolish slavery? She's going to use her voice. She's going to use her education to write uh, one of the most popular books of the 19th century, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, will kind of retreat up to Maine where she will draft Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and this is, like I mentioned, it's like the bestseller in the 19th century. This book sells over a million copies, second only to the Bible during that time. Uh, it's a bestseller in every sense of the word. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is a unique literary work in the sense that it really brings uh, slavery kind of to the forefront of the minds of people who are removed from it, you know, who maybe are living, you know, in the North who are really removed geographically from slavery at this point, it showcases just how terrible of an institution it is. And I included this quote on the screen because I love that Harriet Beecher Stowe recognized that she needed to do something to address these injustices, acknowledging that she felt now that the time has come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity is bound to speak. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. You know, this idea of why is it important to maybe tell these difficult stories? You know, what change can come from telling difficult stories? Um, we know a lot of change can come from sharing these stories. Uh, this book was not well received by everyone. There are people who are livid that it is being printed uh, and distributed and read. You have people who are burning this book. Um, you have people in the North who are, who are, fascinated in a sense and intrigued to find out just how pervasive this institution of slavery is. You know, it's it's a big deal, this book. Uh, we can't prove this, but there's a great fable that goes that upon meeting Abraham Lincoln, uh, that when, he, uh, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, I believe in 1863, uh, that he made some kind of comment to her, you know, oh, you're the woman, you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. You know, it illustrates just really how impactful a book can be. Um, and it certainly was. Uncle Tom's Cabin will really kind of push and accelerate the abolition movement and bring us closer to the brink of war. Now, we are going to move on to our fourth and final Harriet. Um, she's probably the least well-known of our four Harriets, but I will tell you she is, they're all my favorites, but I absolutely love the story of one Harriet Ann Jacobs. Uh, Harriet Ann Jacobs is born in North Carolina. I think I'm getting this right. If you're from North Carolina, tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Edenton or Edenton, North Carolina. Uh, she's born enslaved, um, but she does write later on that she didn't necessarily realize that she was enslaved right off the bat, that she had it that bad uh, because she had some education. She was treated well, as she mentioned um, early on in her life. Um, and she could read and she could write and she, you know, she felt that she had more than the average enslaved person, if you will. But Harriet Ann Jacobs is soon sold to a, a man uh, named Dr. James Norcom. Uh, and Dr. Norcom uh, is is terrible for lack of a better word, just absolutely vicious to Harriet. Um, there are instances where he repeatedly tries to assault her, harasses her, threatens to sell her away from her children to separate her. Um, and Harriet realizes that she very much, she's fearing for her life and she doesn't know what to do. Um, you know, she's looking at those options. Keep in mind, she's in North Carolina. It's a far away, far, far away. 
uh, to get, um, you know, to get north or perhaps even west uh, in this sense. Um, and she needs to do something. She needs to get out of this institution. So what does she do? Well, she hides. Uh, Harriet Ann Jacobs will hide in the attic, the garret of her grandmother's house. Um, I want you to visualize this, okay? It's about nine feet by three feet by four feet. So nine feet, three feet, four feet. Um, not a very big crawl space at all. Uh, but Harriet Jacobs hides there uh, and tries to trick uh, Dr. Norcom that she has run away. And it works. You know, he he's I put on the screen here. He issues an ad. He writes an ad for her return. He, you know, return. And he describes what she looks like. You know, I think she's gone north. I think she might be here. Um, but Harriet Ann Jacobs is just hiding and she's staying in that crawl space. Um, the most heartbreaking part of this story for me, and I, and, and it's always difficult to share this with, with learners is that Harriet Ann Jacobs stays in that crawl space, uh, for nearly seven years, uh, until it is safe for her to finally come out, to find her way eventually north to Philadelphia, then New York, and then finally to Boston, uh, when she's able to make her escape by boat. So, She's in that crawl space for seven years um, and watches her children grow up through a little hole. Um, you know, there's, she has horrible uh, physical limitations for the rest of her life um, resulting from this, from this hiding. Um, but she needed to stay there to a watch her children and make sure that they were not going to endure some horrific, you know, to, to endure even more horrific treatment, but also she needed to make sure it was safe for her to leave too. Um, but when she finally makes her way to Boston, she meets up with, you know, these leaders, these very vocal leaders of the abolitionist movement in Boston, and they hear her story. They're so moved by it. Uh, they tell her, you know, you need to do so. You need to tell people this story. And that's where we see her voice come into play when she writes her autobiography, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, I highly recommend this book. It is a short, short read. You can find it at bookstores. Um, and it's an incredible account of, of her life, um, as, as and, and describing how she survived for nearly seven years in that garret. Um, I love this quote on the screen here where she accounts that I, she suffered for air even more than for light, but she was not comfortless because she heard the voices of her children. Um, I am happy to say that uh, her children do eventually make their way north. Um, there is a happy ending in that sense for, for, these, for these figures. Um, but Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl is published in 1861, uh, just a couple of months before violent breaks out. Um, and we are now involved in a full-blown civil war. Um, but that's not where the story ends with our four Harriets. Um, you know, we know that Harriet Tubman serves as a spy for the Union and helps free, I think, an estimated 700, 800 uh, enslaved individuals in the Combahee uh, River raid um, because she knows the terrain so well from serving, um, you know, being that leader of the Underground Railroad. She's able to get these Union troops and kind of navigate where they need to go. Um, she's essentially our first female military officer in this sense. It's amazing. Thing. Um, you know, what people also don't realize, because we tend to think of Harriet Tubman solely in the Civil War and the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman is a suffragist. Um, you know, she is an advocate for women's rights as well. And that's just incredible. Uh, we do know that Harriet Beecher Stowe did eventually meet President Abraham Lincoln. I'm not sure if he did say that to her about being the woman who made this great war, but I'd like to think it lends itself to how impactful Uncle Tom's Cabin was. Uh, and we know that Harriet Scott, um, you know, she and Dredd uh, will will see, well, rather Harriet Scott will see the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, which reverses the Dred Scott decision. She lives to see that case and so does her daughter, but um, but uh, her daughters, but Dred does not. Um, and we know that Harriet Ann Jacobs, along with her daughter, will also support those efforts, those for the newly freed individuals, these these um the Freedmen's Bureau initiatives and helping up set up resources for these now like 4 million formerly enslaved people who now need to integrate into society, you know, that has formally cast them aside for so long. Um, but as you think about the four Harriets, as you, as you listen to their stories, have you, you know, if some of them may have been familiar to you, maybe you learned something new, but think about ways that you can change 
you know, you can use your voice to change the world or change something in your community. You know, you could, you could vote, uh, you can educate all of our fabulous teachers out there doing good work on the ground. Uh, you can volunteer or you can do exactly what you're doing right now. And you can learn, you can listen to the stories of the four Harriets. You can listen to the stories that you've heard today for our Juneteenth programming, and you can share what you've learned with your friends, your family, your students, your teachers, anyone who wants to listen about everything that you've uncovered, everything that you've learned. So with that, I will formally end this portion of the program. I will officially stop recording. And I want to thank you all so much for tuning in to our Juneteenth programs. This was the last virtual program of the day. Uh, if you missed any programs, feel free to head on over to the Constitution Center's YouTube channel. Um, we have all of our programs for today that were up uh, on our YouTube channel, and you can watch those again if you'd like. Um, but again, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been a wonderful way to celebrate our nation's second Independence Day. Um, I hope you learned something, uh, and I hope you can take that back and share it with your loved ones ones, your friends, your family, whoever. So thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope to see you again soon at another National Constitution Center program. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye.